Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you guys don't know me, my name is Tanner Manson. I run the Future Investing YouTube channel. Welcome, I like to talk about fintech stocks. So a quick rundown for SoFi before we get started, just in case you guys potentially haven't heard of me or SoFi itself. SoFi is a digital bank that I love investing in, okay? They've seen continuous growth in their user base, which is across all different types of products like checking accounts, lending products, financial services products, all sorts of things, right? This has led to greatly increased revenue over time, which has not just been recently, but also for many years to come. It's also led to better improvements on their margins and actually, you know, bringing some profits down to the bottom line. But essentially, that's all you really need to know before we get into these top five picks. Number one, I wanted to talk about their product differentiator for why I'm buying SoFi. SoFi is loved by their users, and you can tell this whenever looking at customer satisfaction scores like what we can see through Trustpilot. Whenever you compare their Trustpilot score of 4.6 out of 5 stars compared to most of the other banks and fintech solutions, they don't even come remotely close. SoFi seems to be in a category of their own, pumping up such high numbers because their users are happy. Now, what does that mean for SoFi exactly? Unlike popular belief where people think that this could potentially lead to higher user growth, well, that's really not what it's for. Higher customer satisfaction can lead to cross-selling users who trust the products they may want to potentially try others, okay? But it also leads to lower churn rates of existing user bases. So the higher customer satisfaction, most likely those people aren't gonna be leaving. Another massive differentiator for SoFi is their target demographic and the approach that they use to deploying new products. Across the board, okay, whenever you're understanding the fintech landscape, you have to understand that these solutions are usually designed for lower income individuals because those are the people who have had more of a struggling space whenever trying to deal with incumbent banks. Look at companies like Robinhood, who have offered retail traders a much cheaper way to actually trade stocks because potentially the, the percent of fees might be much larger than their overall accounts that they're actually dealing with versus some maybe more affluent customers. Same thing with Affirm, for example. They can offer loans to users with absolutely no credit history, where whenever going to incumbent banks, the price for these style of products might be way higher than what was possible before Affirm had actually come in. Whereas for high income, high FICO individuals, they are not mistreated whenever going to, you know, incumbent banks. If you're banking with Bank of America and JP Morgan and you're making $200,000 and you have 750 credit score, you're kind of treated pretty great at these types of banks. And in fact, there are no predatory fees like maintenance fees or potential overdraft fees because those people don't really have those similar problems. So the barrier to entry for these high-end demographics is extremely hard because you're competing against the most well-capitalized players in the entire banking space. SoFi goes after this exact demographic, and they did it by offering a very different offering than traditional fintech solutions. They offer a very wide product offering, meaning that they'll offer you a deposit account, a debit card, a f you know, full brokerage services, personal loans, student loans, mortgages, credit cards, insurance policies, budgeting tools, employee benefit solutions, really something that is a very wide net comparatively to something like a Robinhood, a firm, or Chime, for example. And although you might think that SoFi is spread really thin, did you know that they're winning market share in every single product category that they're in? That's exceedingly rare for any company, but even more impressive knowing that SoFi is this David in a many Goliaths type situation. With their direct deposit users having a median FICO score of 744 points and their lending demographics with average weighted incomes of 164,000 and average FICO scores of 762. Now all of this sounds good enough to win big, but SoFi is topped with vertical integration from the bottom up. SoFi has its own nationally chartered bank license to host their customer deposits, which not only lowers their cost of funding for their loans sections, but it also means that they don't have to pay one of the incumbent banks to hold their deposits like you see the entire fintech industry doing. They also own their own technology platform that actually deals with the banking infrastructure that they use, as well as an entire payment processing service that deals with their entire card program. They issue their own debit cards, they issue their own credit cards, they own their own in-house developed underwriting and application services for all three of their lending services, personal loans, student loans, and mortgages. All of these different offerings are all built in-house. These are all of the amazing product differentiators that I believe in for SoFi, but they're only important if SoFi is actually expanding their user base. 
That's where number two comes in, brand awareness. SoFi CEO Anthony Noto believes that brand awareness is the only thing that's separating SoFi from the 7.5 million users that they have today and 20 million users that they will have into the future. And so obviously, they've been aggressively ramping up their brand awareness through sports sponsorships because they reach a young audience, roughly the 20 to 45 range, which is their exact target audience. SoFi very famously back in 2019 signed a $600 million contract to buy the naming rights of the most expensive stadium in the United States located in Inglewood, California, which is now actually called SoFi Stadium. Then, with absolutely no plans of slowing down, in October of 2023, SoFi announced that they will become the presenting sponsor of the entire new sports league, TGL, which is actually a golf league started by Tiger Woods that is actually set to debut in January of 2025. There was actually supposed to start in 2024, but that got delayed a year. During that time, okay, it's now February, and in this month, what SoFi ended up doing is saying, hey, we don't want to wait till January of next year for this new sports league to get, you know, start cooking. So why don't we just become the official banking partner of the NBA so then we can reach their hundreds of millions of viewers right now? So you have the NFL and all of the sports leagues that are going on and entertainment things that are happening at SoFi Stadium, okay? You have the hundreds of millions of viewers that could be watching TGL when that starts out, okay? And now you have the NBA, that does have hundreds of millions of users, all in this massive sports conglomerate, which SoFi is just putting their name brand on every single piece, all over the shorts, all over the videos, all over the TV, and in person. Whenever you stack this with, you know, standard referral programs, commercials, large social media presence, it's proving to be enough to really accelerate growth into the future, but that's if they can afford it. Number three, profitability. SoFi, since becoming a public company back in Q2 of 2021, has not been a public company by a net income basis. Unlike the latest quarter, however, where they actually posted a two-cent EPS, which was a very large beat compared to what they were supposed to do, and they ended up posting a near 8% income margin. Anthony Noto and team also believe that from a net income basis, they will be profitable for the foreseeable future. This is the exact opportunity for an inflection point in SoFi's valuation because right now certain metrics like, you know, PE ratios are still not even popping up. And if you're not very familiar with SoFi, you may think of them as being a non-profitable company. And in the trailing 12 months, they haven't been. But going forward is where the opportunity lies. So listen to this. SoFi's management believes that they're going to do about 7 to $0.08 cents of EPS for the entirety of 2024. SoFi management also expects them to grow those earnings all the way to 2026 to 55 cents to 80 cents per share. Now, earnings per share is the cleanest way to look at net income because management can also account for share dilution from things like stock-based compensation for their employees. So that's roughly a 10x in their net income for the full year of 2024 all the way to 2026. And assuming this comes true, this puts their price to earnings growth ratio or peg ratio at a 0.65 times, which if you're a follower of the greatest growth investors of all time, like Peter Lynch, a peg ratio less than one times is the leading indicator of finding an undervalued stock in his opinion. But that is only if their targets actually are true for their earnings estimates. Number four, sandbagging. I'm gonna keep this short and simple. SoFi has become a public company that has never missed its earning estimates. In fact, if we take a look closer, we can actually see that SoFi has done a triple beat for every single earnings call that they've done since being a public company back in Q2 of 2021. That means not only have they beat their medium target for revenue, not only beat their medium target for net income, but also increased their guidance as well. Now, the majority of the time, they actually end up going above their highest end sides of their guidance as well, but that's the exact thing. SoFi's management is a beat and raise style, which means whenever looking at what they're actually projecting, it's usually much lower than what's actually going to be coming out from the company. I have no reason to believe that Anthony Noto and his team are not sandbagging their 10 times earnings per share estimates from the full year of 2024 all the way to full year of 2026. Yet the expectations on average from Wall Street are estimating that the earnings per share for the full year of 2026 will come at, at 52 cents for the entirety of the year. 
That's not their middle point guidance. That's not their lower end of the guidance. That is below SoFi's lowest end of their guidance, which means SoFi would actually be missing those targets, which they have given me no reason to believe that that would ever be the case in SoFi's reality. Wall Street is completely detached from the historical outcomes of SoFi's performance, and I personally want to stick to the stats. If SoFi continues down the path of beating expectations and raising guidance for the long term, the stock will continue to have their earnings revised, and so will the actual share price. Number five, institutional ownership. Although SoFi has some of the most amazing benefits of product differentiation to bring on new customers to tailwinds in the stock price from valuation increases and profitability, they still are not winning over Wall Street. Currently, SoFi's institutional holdings are less than 40%. When comparing that to most fintechs and especially, you know, large incumbent banks, you're seeing rates of institutional holdings about 60 to 70% in this landscape. And that's not even including the short interest that SoFi has accumulated of over 15% of their outstanding shares. If in fact SoFi can hit or exceed their growth targets, short sellers are going to be forced to cover while new institutions will flood in to accumulate ownership in this fast growing bank of the future. If you agree or disagree, please let me know in the comments. But if you're looking for extensive levels of investment research on, you know, SoFi and other great companies like Nubank in the future, plus a complete framework on what to look for whenever you're looking at your own innovative growth stocks, make sure you check out futureinvesting.pro for a complete in-depth course of investing in innovation going forward. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye for now.